ask you, I'd like to, ask, oh, thank you for recording. I'd like to get started by asking you to share with me in the chat um, what you know about a liquid syllabus. Is it new to you? Do you have one? Have you seen one? I'm just a little bit curious. Brand new. Okay, a lot of new. Good, good, good. A lot, it looks like some people already have one, have seen one, never done one. Okay, so we're gonna demystify what we mean by liquid syllabus. And it's your invitation to consider whether or not this is something that you'd like to adopt in your practice. There's lots of variations of it out there. And I think with anything that we do with teaching, you take ideas and you may take a piece of them and work them into your teaching. You may take the whole idea and work it right in. So adapt this to your needs. Um, I want to start out by acknowledging that syllabus redesign is a well-known equitable practice and this is nothing that I'm trying to suggest is brand new. We have lots of existing research-based practices that show how important it is to create a syllabus that is inviting and welcoming to all students. So I have some links on this slide if you'd like to explore them. I have a link to the CBC OEI and At One uh, Equity and Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Online Environment course. CBC OEI and At One, that's the group that, that I work with. Um, and I am faculty mentor for CBC OEI and At One. And uh, our equity and CRT course is facilitated by faculty from across our system, the California Community College system. Uh, Fabiola Torres, who presented yesterday, is one of our facilitators. And uh, it's certainly been a life-changing course for many hundreds and hundreds of faculty who have taken it over the past couple of years since it was uh, introduced. The Center for Urban Education, also known as Q, has a fabulous syllabus resource guide. Um, that they call an inquiry tool for promoting racial and ethnic equity and equity-minded practice. So check that out. And more recently, uh, my colleague Kim Vincent Layton shared this fabulous article um, that is linked in the third bullet, the social, social justice syllabus design tool. And that's something you could check out. And there's also a Google site linked at the bottom by Lene Whitley Putz and Fabiola Torres that they designed to go along with um, an online teaching conference workshop that they did a couple of years ago. So I just want to acknowledge that there are so many people that are focusing on syllabus redesign. And what we're going to do here is weave in this dimension of humanizing, I think, to some of these existing effective practices. So just as a friendly reminder, looping back to a slide from day one, Instructor to student relationships lie at the heart of humanizing. They serve as the connective tissue between students engagement and rigor. That relationship is where engagement begins and it's also where rigor derives from for many students. It's critical and when students are in a place of trauma as they are now, it's even more important. So positive relationships emerge from trust. That's at the heart of this session today. There, is, there are no positive relationships that come out of distrust. We have to start with trust. But course syllabi often send cues of distrust and hostility. How do they do that? In the chat, how do you think they do that? Give me an example of how a syllabus might send a cue of distrust. Rules, 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 punitive rules. They can seem cold, rigidity, demanding, overly dry, lots of no's, all caps, all capitals, deadlines, you must do this, authoritative. Okay, I think you got it. I didn't think I'd have to unpack that too much for you. Thank you for your contributions. And of course, also at the heart of humanizing is the, the fact that the students on the other side of our screen 
are a diverse group of humans that bring their own stories, experiences, backgrounds to our courses. We also know that they come with mindsets that are linked to, shaped by, and informed by their experiences, their stories. And these mindsets can get in the way, they can interfere with learning because learning occurs at the intersection of thinking and feeling. So humanizing scaffolds and supports that effective domain of learning or the feeling one of the mindsets um, that can in influence the performance of individuals in higher education as well as in life in general is imposter syndrome also known as imposterism goes by different names um, let me know in the chat if this is a new concept to you i'm just curious not new to you New, new. Okay, so it's it's not new to some of you, and it is new to others. Um, yeah, uh, this is something that I wish I had professors that had shared this with me when I was in grad school. Um, most professionals learn about imposter syndrome um, later in life, and imposter syndrome is an individual's belief that he or she is an intellectual fraud who will soon be exposed. It tends to affect highly successful or highly capable individuals in many disciplines and fields. The consequences are that imposterism prevents the sharing of one's ideas because we are always so critical of it. If you're someone who has recognized your emotional armor as perfectionism, I would expect that you are relating to this idea right now. You have a compulsion to be the very best. Superhuman expectations are what you hold for yourself. You have a fear of failure and exposure, denial of your own abilities, discount of praise, fear of or guilt about success. Yeah, explains crying through grad school, Karen. I feel you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, this is a deep one. I'm not going to play this video now, but I want to encourage you to loop back to it and watch this video. Um, it might provide some self care for you. The other uh, or one of the other non cognitive factors that can influence a student's academic performance is stereotype threat. And stereotype threat may be new to some of you, it may not. Um, it comes from the work of Steele and Aronson, and there is a significant body of research on this, which is all very, very fascinating. I encourage you to dig deeper on your own. Um, stereotype threat is when a person feels at risk of, conf that should say, conf yeah, confirming, confirming a negative stereotype about their identity. When a person feels at risk of confirming a negative stereotype about one's identity, it's brought on by situations. Negative stereotypes about intelligence are more likely to trigger stereotype threat in college students who are black, indigenous and people of color and women in STEM courses. And that's what the research shows. Uh, but stereotype threat can really affect anyone who identifies with a particular stereotype. When we're talking about students in academia, in higher education, we're talking about those stereotypes about who is smart, about who belongs in college, even about what a professor is supposed to look like. So your own teaching identity play, stereotype can play into that when you're doing something like recording a video. And this can be really powerful to learn about also. The consequences of stereotype threat are engage, disengagement, underachievement on exams, and other academic tasks. Students will convince themselves that they're not good enough. They're more likely to make one mistake and say, see, I knew I wasn't good enough. I'm done here. I, don't, I, I shouldn't be doing this. And so when you see something in your class, like this student is no longer participating, 
or if there's an apprehension for a, a person to engage in an activity like showing oneself on video, this could be a factor. It's not the only factor. We've talked about other factors in day one, but this is certainly something to keep in mind. So I am gonna play this video here um, by Claude Steele um, out of Stanford University, who is one of the lead researchers on stereotype threat. I'm just gonna throw, whoops. What did I do there? Hold on a second. I'm just gonna play a clip of it. So let me navigate to that real quick. And I want you to pay attention particularly to the second part when he talks about what we can do to mitigate stereotype threat. Uh, we're all members of groups, have identities that are negatively stereotyped. There's not a single identity that doesn't have a negative stereotype about it. And whenever you're in a situation where that negative stereotype is relevant to you, and you care about the situation, you care about doing well, you could experience this stereotype threat. Being older, being young, being gay, being conservative, being liberal, having cancer, anything. Uh, you, people will, as they, you go down that list of identities, uh, you recognize that in some circumstances, you could feel like you're going to be seen negatively because you've got that identity and that stereotype threat. So in, in, a, in a school situation where groups have, have very elaborated stereotypes, uh, they're, they're often under this kind of, of, uh, of pressure, of, of uh, worrying that they're going to be seen in terms of that, reacting to that, uh, trying to push that off. Well, if stereotype threat and identity threat are the problem in a situation, then what you need to focus on is building a sense of identity safety in the, in the classroom or in the workplace. And that's a sense where a person can trust that uh, they're not going to be exposed to negative experiences based on having an identity. There have to be some effort put into building that kind of assurance in the people who are in the, in the, in the setting. And we have to recognize that that's a little something extra, seems extra, but we really have to do that in order for everybody to feel identity safe in the situation, safe enough to function and, and flourish in the situation without this, this threat, without this, this pressure. As much as we can, we have to attend to these things. They really do make a difference. We have to, in classrooms, uh, a, a part of, uh, uh, of allowing students from these groups a sense of safety in the classroom involves uh, representing the classroom, cues, the cues in it, uh, as valuing identities and, and uh, as seeing them as positive and as valuing the diversity that people bring to a, a, an enterprise like schooling. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Um, I'm seeing a lot of powerful comments in the chat that this is resonating. Yeah, when I first learned about stereotype threat and imposterism, it was, it was a big deal. And it really got me thinking about why my students aren't engaging, particularly at the start of an online course. So as we mentioned on day one in our anatomy of learning session, and in, you know, in a, in a in a face-to-face -face course, we are used to thinking about greeting our students, welcoming them on day one. Um, in online courses, when it starts, right, when that day one is, is a little bit kind of ambiguous. We have a first day of instruction, but we also know that there's this high opportunity zone even before the course begins. If you have access, and I hear from some faculty, sadly, that they don't have the ability to publish their course before the first week of the semester or term. Um, so it is important to find out what your institution allows for and also question why they don't allow for that. Um, but if you do have access to students that you can email, send an email before a course begins and let them know, hey, the course is unpublished and in that email include something like a liquid syllabus, which we'll 
tend to more in a moment here, uh, to reduce that belongingness uncertainty. Um, this is really a high opportunity zone. And think about that all the way through week one. This is when you need to be identifying those high opportunity students and extending your personal touch to them. The second concept I want us to unpack a bit more is going to be unpacked by one of my, um, my favorite scholars, and that is Brene Brown. We're going to watch a video by Dr. Brene Brown that talks about trust and helps us to understand how trust is like a marble jar. So I want you to be reflecting on this concept of a marble jar and keep your students in mind keep you building trust with your students in mind because like we've said relationships only emerge from trust and our students many of our students enter our course from a place of distrust because of things like stereotype threat because of the way that they have been treated in education before college starting in preschool there's evidence that students who are black particularly black males are treated with distrust and disdain. And um, I'm now starting to re reflect on some of the work of Luke Wood, Dr. Luke Wood. And I wanna acknowledge that I mistakenly scheduled this session at the same time of one of his Black Minds Matter sessions this morning, which I kicked myself for doing, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that, that that is in my mind. So the work of Dr. Luke Wood is definitely um, in the heart of all of this. I forgot when I'm starting. Let's see, 119. Let me navigate over to that part of the video and start playing. It's literally sorry. And the topic of trust is something I think I probably would have eventually started to look at closely um, because I study shame and vulnerability. But there's a very personal reason I, I jumped to trust early in my research career, and it was a personal experience. Um, one day, my daughter, Ellen, came home from school. She was in third grade. And the minute we closed the front door, she literally just started sobbing and slid down the door until she was just kind of a heap of crying on the floor. And of course, I was, it scared me. And I said, oh my, what's wrong, Ellen? What happened? What happened? And she pulled herself together enough to say, I, something really hard happened to me today at school, and I shared it with a couple of my friends during recess and by the time we got back into the classroom everyone in my class knew what had happened and they were laughing and pointing at me and calling me names and it was so bad and the kids were being so disruptive that her teacher even had to take marbles out of this marble jar. And the marble jar in the classroom is a jar where if the kids are making great, be, you know, great choices together, the teacher adds marbles. If they're making not great choices, the teacher takes out marbles. And if the jar gets filled up, there's a celebration about the, for the class. And so she said, it was one of the worst moments of my life. They were laughing and pointing, and Ms. Balkan, my teacher, kept saying, I'm going to take marbles out, you know, and she didn't know what was happening. And she looked at me, and she, just with this face that is just seared into my mind, and said, I will never trust anyone again. And my first reaction, to be really honest with you, was damn straight. Um, <laughs> you don't tell anybody anything <laughs> but your mama. <laughs> um, yeah, right? That's it. I mean, that was my, that was my, like, you, you just tell me, and when you grow up and you go off to school, mama will go too, I'll get a little apartment. Um, and the other thing I was thinking, to be quite honest with you, is I will find out who those kids were. <laughs> and while I'm not going to beat up a nine-year-old, I know they're mamas. Uh, I, that's, you know, that's the place you go to. And I'm like, how am I going to explain trust to this third grader in front of me? So I took a deep breath and I said, Ellen, trust is like a marble jar. She said, what do you mean? And I said, you share those hard stories and those hard things that are happening to you with friends who over time you filled up their marble jar. They've done thing after thing after thing where you're like, I know I can share this with this person. Does that make sense? And that's what Ellen said. Yes, that makes sense. And I said, do you have any marble jar friends? And she said, oh yeah, I, I totally, Hannah and Lorna are marble jar friends. 
And I said, and then this is where things got interesting. And I said, tell me what you mean. What, how, how do they earn marbles for you? And she's like, well, Lorna, if there's not a seat for me at the lunch cafeteria, she'll scoot over and give me half a Heine seat. <laughs> and I'm like, she will? She's like, yeah, she'll just sit, she'll just sit that like that and so I can sit with her. And I said, that's a big deal. This is not what I was expecting to hear. And I said, and she, then she said, and you know, Hannah, on Sunday at my soccer game, and I was waiting for this story where she said, I got hit by a ball, and I was laying on the field, and Hannah picked me up and ran me to first aid. Um, and I was like, yeah? And she said, Hannah looked over, and she saw Oma and Opa, my parents, my, her grandparents, and she said, look, your Oma and Opa are here. And I was like... <laughs> and I was like, boy, she got a marble for that? And she goes, well, you know, not all my friends have eight grandparents. Um, because my parents are divorced and remarried. My husband's parents are divorced and remarried. And she said, and it was so nice to me that she remembered their names. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> and she said, do you have marble jar front? And I said, yeah, I do have a. Okay, I'm going to stop there, although it's a super good video, and I encourage you to keep moving forward, watching it on your own. Um, but the concept of a marble jar is... I think super helpful. Um, I know, I know, Armida, I'm sorry. I think it's super helpful because it, it gives us this visual. If we picture our students with a marble jar, you know, I, I imagine that there are students who don't even hold a marble jar when it comes to going into a course experience. Um, that's equity right there, is building trust. And the video that she just talked about, again, which is derived, it is based in research that she has done since that story happened in, in, her, in Brene Brown's life. Um, little things matter. That's the takeaway. Little things, the cues. So lay that on top of what you heard Dr. Claude Steele say about creating an environment that fosters identity safety. It's how do we, what cues can we send and how do we send those cues to be sure that those are the messages students are receiving. So now we're going to transition over to the liquid syllabus side and I'm going to show a video about what I mean by liquid syllabus just to introduce it and then we're going to talk more about what goes into it. So this is called benefits of a liquid syllabus, but it is just some of the benefits. I wish I could retitle it. Um, and yeah, Laverne is asking, can you give an example of a cue? So a cue is, you know, a message. What messages does our course send to different students? And I think I'll answer that question as we move forward. I know what you're thinking. I have a syllabus. And I've worked really hard on it. So why should I take the time to also create a liquid syllabus? And what does that mean anyway? After all, I already have my syllabus online in the form of a PDF, and I know all my students can access it in Canvas. But folks, the thing is, when your syllabus is behind a login screen, it may be tough for students to get to it from their phone. And no matter how lovely it looks on a computer, reading it on a mobile device is tough. The information in that syllabus is important, right? The bottom line is, when we use tools designed for print products, they don't result in mobile-friendly experiences. And that's not good for our students. How might things change if you used a website tool, like Google Sites or WordPress, to create a liquid version of your syllabus? For just a moment, imagine being a student. It's the start of your first semester in college and the week before class starts. You check your email and you get a friendly welcome message from your sociology instructor. It includes a button at the bottom to check the syllabus. You tap that button with your finger and instantly you go to a syllabus that's easy to read and experience with the swipe of your finger. And you also discover something pretty special at the top. Hi scholars, my name is Katie Whitman-Conklin and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. 
A little bit about me, I lived in the Central Valley of California for a lot of years with my husband and children while he was stationed there with the Navy. And when he retired, we moved to Northern Idaho where we now live with our kids on a family ranch. You think to yourself, hey, I'm gonna love this class. I can't wait to get started. But you know what? That's not the only benefit of a liquid syllabus. Since it lives on the web, it's shareable with a simple link. That means you can place that link in as many other places as you'd like. How about adding it next to your course description in your college's class schedule? Or on your profile page on your college website? Or a link on your own professional website? And you know what can really help promote your course and encourage more students to enroll? That's right, share it on Twitter. When we design with web tools, we create mobile-friendly content that supports our students in so many ways. It also lets them know we care. So hopefully that gets us started with thinking about cues, an example of a cue, right? So if you're on a phone and you get something sent to you that doesn't open on a phone, or you know it just says click here to view and then you're you're you haven't started the semester yet and you have to log in um, those are cues those are sending cues and it might send different cues to different students for some people it might not be an issue for others it might they might realize i don't know how to log into this course and then have to go figure that out um, but the phone part of it is a big deal so some of the the cues would be, um, you know, if we publish it publicly, so it's simply a public link that's easy to get to and clickable. Uh, we know that most students, when they access, most, most student age people, when they access content it's, and check email, it's usually on the phone. Um, and using a website creation tool allows us to do that. There's no download, there's no application needed other than a browser that's already built into a phone. So we wanna make it easy to get to. Um, and again, website creation tools, there's, there's lots of them out there. Um, you, you are going to hear me talking about Google Sites. When I, I work with faculty all across the state of California, and what I hear is that most faculty don't have access to a web space. Um, I have Melissa Prinzing had mentioned that why, why can't we just use um, Canvas and make it public. That's an option you can explore, but there are some colleges that don't allow courses in Canvas to be shared publicly. So there are a lot of variations here. Um, and if you are familiar with a particular web tool and you have access to it, then by all means, feel free to explore that. Um, the resources that we've prepared, prepared for you will walk you through how to use Google Sites. And I also want to address the note at the bottom of the screen here um, that your liquid syllabus will need to meet web accessibility standards. The degree to which you can make your site accessible as you build it is influenced by the tool that you choose. So uh, Google Sites has done a in my opinion, a very good job of building in accessibility and making it easy to make a site accessible. When you add content, for example, like videos, as was just mentioned in the chat, those videos do need to be accurately captioned. Let's drill into that phone topic a little bit more. Nationally, this is based on a study from um, EduCause in 2020. More community college students, 96% of them own a smartphone than a laptop. So that's something to keep in mind. And as we are going into a semester here where students have, they're not, they're not students that have said, hey, I wanna take that class online. These are students that now have to take that class online. These are students that may have relied upon computers on campus to access the digital components of a course. And that's no longer available to them. So this is a big deal. Um, and also, when we consider making our learning environments phone friendly, that is an anti-racist strategy. The percentage of adults who do not use broadband at home but have a smartphone by race 
those, that data is represented below. And in that graph, you can see the bottom line, those are white Americans. The middle line, those are black American adults. And the top line are Hispanic Americans. So that is really important to remember. Smartphones are the access point for the internet for many people, particularly um, the data shows, I'll go back a slide, uh, by those who are low income, who are younger, and who are Black or Hispanic. That's according to the Pew Research data. Also include a brief imperfect welcome video. Embed it right there at the top. And I'm, I, I got teary um, this morning when I looked at our video page from yesterday, the videos that had been shared, and I actually grabbed two of them and I put them right on the slide. So these two videos that you see here were created just yesterday by two of our Humanizing Challenge participants. This one's by Vivian Varela. Welcome to the very first offering of Intro to LBGT Studies Fall 2020 at Mendocino College. I am so excited that you're here. This class will really focus on diversity, inclusion, and presence, both mine and yours, and I'm looking forward to having you in class. A bit of fun facts about me. Uh, I am identify as she, her, hers. I am cisgendered, pansexual, and I didn't come out until age 50. We will get through this class together. We cannot go it alone. We need each other. Okay, I'm, I'm just not going to play the whole thing, but it's there for you to go back and watch. And I want to play a clip of Carlos Manuel Chavarria's video also. Hi, I'm Professor Carlos Manuel Chavarria. I will be your professor for Introduction to Theater, Script Analysis, in Chicano and Latinx theater. I love teaching, but I also love Harry Potter, Doctor Who, and Star Wars. In short, I'm a nerd at heart. Thank you to everyone who stepped in, leaned into their emotional armor yesterday, who persevered, um, you know, who, who made their, took the risk to be vulnerable on video. I, I just, it's, it's really, it's really credible. Um, and I, I, I just want to recognize everybody. I know that a lot of you are still working on videos or haven't even had time to get to them yet, but it's just been amazing to see what happened yesterday. So, um, thank you so much. And, um, and seeing a lot of comments in the chat, acknowledging the greatness of those videos also. Value diversity and community. Take time to write a teaching philosophy. And as you write it, take a step back and read it and ask yourself, how can I ensure that diversity and community are embraced as assets in, a, in your teaching community? In your teaching philosophy. So this is an example one right here that that I wrote that I use in my own liquid syllabus. Um, you are welcome to adapt it without my permission. If you use it in a non student facing resource like a faculty development resource, I just ask for attribution. So um, that's something to think about a teaching philosophy. Be a learning partner. Create a pact and include that in your liquid syllabus. Remember, you're thinking about cues that you're sending to your students at the start of a course, even before the start of a course. If you can cue them that they're not in this alone, that you are a partner in their learning, just like the way those videos did, then you are on the right track. Um, this is how we create identity safety. So in your learning pact, include what you can, what your students can expect from you and what you will expect from them. Number six, I will treat you with dignity and respect and be flexible to support your individual needs. What is it that you would include in your learning pact? And how could you include your students so that they have an opportunity to help build your pact with you? 
What I like to do is include number eight that says, is there anything else you'd like to add to this list and get them thinking about that. And then when they're in the course, they have a discussion that I've posted with the packed in it again. It may be the first time they've seen it, it may be the second time, but I ask them to either leave a reply saying you agree to our pact or add something to either one of these columns and then it becomes a discussion. Redesign your policies with welcoming language. So one of the policies that I bet is in your syllabus is something about late assignments. We off, this is often where we see red text, right? So the unwelcoming example, no late assignments are accepted. I understand things will happen during the semester, but a deadline is a deadline. This lesson will serve you well in your future job. You must develop your, you must develop your own, that should say own system of time management to get your readings and assignments done on time. That, that typo is on me, by the way. Um, and then a welcoming example, every assignment has a due date. I expect you to strive to submit each assignment by the due date. And then let students know why. This ensures I have an opportunity to give you feedback and missing a due date in an online class often leads to missing another due date. You see that in online courses. Getting behind is overwhelming and it can derail your ability to make progress towards our learning goals and I want you to succeed. Late assignments will be marked down 10% each day. And if you wanna avoid that penalty, all you need to do is send me a message when you anticipate a problem. Propose an extension. We'll come to an agreement together. So really encouraging that interaction. And again, the tone of all of this helps students feel more comfortable because they're gonna feel like it's an environment where they're not gonna get shot down if they ask for assistance and help. Use easy to use language, avoid academic jargon. Take a look at the words that you use. Sometimes we're so unaware of using acronyms and maybe discipline specific phrases that you learned in grad school. Be concise and clear. Stop as you're writing and ask yourself, what am I trying to say and how can I say this more succinctly and more clearly? Redesign policies, oops, I just said that. Sorry, I went back instead of forward. Um, and also with a, a, a liquid syllabus, it makes it so much easier to make an environment that is visual and easy to scan. Use color with sufficient contrast. That's an accessibility um, tip right there. Don't make everything black and white, right? Use color, it's, an, it's engaging, but you just wanna be sure that the contrast between the color and the background is sufficient so that um, individuals with lower vision can see what it is that you're creating. And also colors vary by monitor. So it's gonna look a little different on another person's screen. So that contrast is important for that reason too. When you insert images onto pages, include alt text to ensure images are accessible to all. And the resource that we have for you guides you through all of this. Accessibility is baked into every step that we have in the resource I'm gonna share with you in just a moment. When you're looking for images, use images of people that represent the students you serve. Start your search in an image repository with share-friendly copyright. Images in images, image repositories, then you know the license that they've been shared with. If you just go to Google and put images in your content from Google, you don't know who made them and you're, you most likely are violating that person's copyright. So start with an image repository, take note of the conditions that they specify are um, to be followed when you reuse the image and that makes things so much easier and unsplashes is, is one that, that I really appreciate. Use headings and subheadings to organize your content. Again, that is an accessibility tip. Not only does it make it easy to use, but it makes it easy to, easier to scan content for screen readers that are used by um, people who are blind. And use bulleted lists, just like you see in this example here. Bulleted lists help the eye to kind of track content on a page instead of just one big long paragraph. Include links. Links are great. Think about what links you could include to really provide, connect students with the resources that they need to support their individual needs. But when you add those links, make them descriptive. 
I've got two examples of links on this page. Um, so if you put, if you simply paste a link or a URL like this one here, next to the sad face, that first bullet, that's not a descriptive link. So when students are looking at your page and when screen readers are navigating your page, this is what they read. The screen reader will actually read that and the person reads that. So it's like, I don't know what that is. You don't want to include that. Don't have that on your site. Instead, type in a description of what the link is going out to and then highlight it and use the, the, the link option in the text toolbar to paste the URL. That way that long URL, the long, the long web address is embedded in the link, but it's not something that, that, that anyone has to actually read. And send your liquid syllabus if you can before your class starts. At the bottom of the syllabus, you can add a link to log into the course. And um, we, as I said, have a resource for you to create your liquid syllabus. This slide links out to it, but it's also linked to the August 12th page on the Humanizing Challenge website, okay? So it takes you to the same place. And I want to um, have you keep a message from Fabiola Torres in mind that she shared with us yesterday. Give, your permission, give yourself permission to make online teaching an act of radical love. And um, let's go out to that resource. And I'm actually, mm, I'm logged in. So I am seeing something different than what you are. Okay, hold on a second. I wanna go into an incognito window. So you see what, I want it to look the way it's gonna look when you go out to it. Okay, so is that the right one? Yeah, so this is what it will look like to you. You will be taken directly to a home page. You will be greeted by me, and I am happy to share. Um, oh, and Helen has shared the link to the page. Thank you, or the link to the the the, pay, the course. I'm saying course. This is designed in Canvas, but as the video on this page explains, it's simply using Canvas kind of like a website. Okay, so it is shared publicly. And um, I'm gonna just show you how to navigate this a little bit. I invite you to watch this video when you do go out to the course from me. On the left side, you'll see two links, one link to modules and one to the Google site support. Just in case you get hung up with something and you need additional support, remember that link is there and it'll take you out to the, the Google resources not our resources. Things do change and Google Sites is still evolving. So they add really great resources to that support site that I encourage you to lean on. And I am going to now click on start here and then select getting started. And this will take you through everything that you need to know to get started, how to set up a Google account if you don't have one, or how to log into your Google account if you do have one. This can be a, 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 this can take you a while because I find that sometimes people say, oh, I have a Google account, but then you can't remember your password. So that's going to be a key step of this. Um, again, a little bit more about the existing scholarship and some more contextual information and examples about language just to help guide you. Um, information about visuals. So again, some of this is a bit redundant based upon what we just looked at. Um, here's the video that you saw. And after we get through some of the introductory pages, you'll get to a page with lots of examples. And we can take a look at some of these examples. I'm going to open just a couple of them here. Let's go out to Mika Lissick from Sierra College. This is her History 27, Ameri uh, Women in American History. Hey class and welcome to your syllabus. My name is Mika Lissick and I want to officially and formally welcome you to our class. So if you can have a little bit of time and make your way through the syllabus, this has all of the really vital information you need to know. Most 
Okay, so you see the videos embedded at the top. Um, her, her home page is, is concise. She's got additional pages over here on the left for course essentials and goals. So different content that can be accessed through the different pages. I encourage you to check these things out on a phone so you can see how they operate on a phone. I think that's one of the most valuable things to do. I want to also open, let's see, this one here by Robert. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to your online sociology class. I am your professor, uh, Robert Wanzer. Um, and you found the syllabus. The syllabus has all kinds of useful information on it, things like assignments, discussions, quizzes and exams, policies, and most importantly, resources and things that uh, might be helpful for you to know. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I am here to help. You can message me through Canvas or my email address, and that is robert.wanzer at canyons.edu. Uh, you'll find that uh, in the syllabus as well. I look forward to seeing you online. Uh, let me know if there's anything I can do to help you be successful. That's literally what I'm here for. I will be here waiting for you to be successful. So let me know. Uh, have a good class. I love that, indeed. Um, so lots of examples to look at. I'm going to go out to the one of mine that I added at the end of just because it shows a navigation at the top. And that's one of the things that we will guide you through. I, I recommend using a top navigation. This is something that, um, that has occurred to me since we started kind of experimenting with Google Sites. But um, I think it, it's a little easier to see this um, on, a, on a phone. So that's just my suggestion. You have two options to either put a navigation up on the top or on the left side and you'll be walked through that in the resources. So all of these links are available in the course. Um, and then we get into step one and it literally takes you through step by step what to do. And there are progress checks at the bottom of most pages that show you what your site should look like at that point. Some of them are videos that you can watch. That's actually a screenshot. Some of you aren't going to need this much support. Some of you will. Okay, so you'll find some how to videos in here. This one shows you how to copy a section uh, to make it a little just kind of go forward a little bit further. And um, I'm going to stop sharing this now because I'm simply just clicking you through a resource that you have access to, but I am going to take some questions and stop sharing my screen. Um, what I'd like you to do is uh, raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask and um, You can do that by clicking on participants at the bottom of your zoom window and then select raise hand. And I got a, a direct message asking me which template is this. I had a hard time figuring out which template to use. So if you go start Google Sites, you have different templates to start with. They give you different options. I create from scratch. So mine is not a template. It's just something that I did from scratch. And that's actually the way that we'll guide you through is to start from scratch. I tried putting these how to steps together using a template and I just found that I ended up deleting stuff and it was, it, I just think it's easier to just start from scratch and then follow just some basic steps. Get, get a chunk at the begin at the top, put a new content paid section at the top, embed your video and your welcome message and, um, and start going from there. And um, I'm going to take a question. So I'm going to look for names that I haven't had interactions yet with over the first three days. So I think Joel Friedman is a is a new name. And let me be sure that you can unmute yourself. Yeah, Joel, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself? Joel Friedman? <laughs> Sorry, I was having no a problem uh, managing that and I uh, also wanted to do the video just to show I'm a real person. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, last three days have been illuminating. I've got experience with Google Sites when I was teaching high school, so I'm totally amenable to creating a web page. 
I'm running out of time and I've been creating a syllabus with lots of links and all kinds of things. And I'm wondering, does the Canvas pa page translate into the phone, I guess, uh, good enough for the time being? Um, from what I understand, it, it does, but I, can I trust that? I think that if you're there and if you're at that point and you can make that content if you, if you can make it public, that, that would be ideal. Check and see if that's an option at, at your institution. It might not be. I think each of you need to do what you can do. This might be something you want to try next semester or a year from now. Some of you are ready to jump in now. You need to be very mindful of where you are. Keep all of the stuff about emotional armor and perfectionism. And I, I know we want to do everything at once, but we can't. And you need, to, you need to have time in your practice to be there for your students, right? So no, yeah. don't spend time building a Google site because your students need you to interact with them. And that's where your time should be focused if that's-, if that's I appreciate it, yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to now ask um, Diana Vera Alba. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? I hear you. It says, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. It kept giving me a message that I, um, anyways. Um, yeah, my, my question was very similar to the last one. So I'm trying to think about this, like, so we use Canvas and um, I'm also gonna create a Google site. So there's gonna be two separate things, but somehow they're gonna be interlinked through links. Hyperlinks, is that correct? Am I understanding that correctly? Yep, absolutely. So when students click on that link, they're actually leaving Cam Canvas or? That, yeah, so if, if, you're, if your students are beginning inside of Canvas, they would, they would go, a new window would open, it, it would take them out to Google Sites, okay. right? So that's how it would work if it's inside of Canvas. If they're okay. not inside of Canvas, if they're just checking their email, if you're trying to get something to them before they've even ever logged into your course, which is the strategy that we're modeling here, mm -hmm. then they just have to click on a link and email and bam, they're right there. Okay, so, so here's what I encourage everyone to do. I see a lot of questions about, will this work? Will that work? Ask yourself, where are you meeting your students? And if your intention is to meet them before your class starts, then here's what I want you to do. Email the link that you're thinking about to yourself. Open up your smartphone, check your email, and click on the link and see what happens. If it functions, if it's usable, right? If, it, if it's not hard to get into, then by all means, use it. Does that help? Yes. Good. Do you have another question or did I, did I answer your question? I hope I answered um, your question. Yeah, you answered my question. Okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted, I was trying to think in my mind, okay, am I building two separate things? And so Canvas and Google Sites are separate, if, okay. that's, if that's what you're going with, yeah. Yes, uh-huh, okay. You can kind of think about it like Canvas and Microsoft Word, if you have mm -hmm. that Word doc, right? So Google Sites is just another thing, but it's, it opens in a browser instead of an external application. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. And um, we're at time, but I'm going to take a, a few more questions. I want to respect everyone's time. And if you need to go, by all means go. I won't take it personally. The archive of our session today will be available shortly on the Humanizing Challenge website, which is online networkofeducators.org slash humanizing challenge. Just click on August, the August 13 button. Yeah, the August 13 button. And um, right under where you see humanizing, uh, your humanizing pre-course contact with the liquid syllabus, you'll see that archive appear there uh, hopefully later today. And it will be followed by accurate captions as soon as we get those processed. So thanks for being here, everyone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to take a few questions. Teresa Langford, would you like to, um, I'm gonna actually unmute you, Teresa. Oh, no, you unmuted, good, go for it. 
I like to find out um, in terms of creating the um, liquid syllabus, if you create one in Canvas and one say in Word, does it mean you actually have two different syllabus but with the same materials? In terms of um, students who want to print out a copy, I don't think the one in Canvas will come out in um, two or three pages. The one from Canvas will probably have a little bit more than just two or three pages. Is that what your experience is? Yes. So if you're talking about creating a digital syllabus in either Canvas or Google Sites, you are right. Printing it is not as an, is not an efficient process like it is with something designed for a tool that's made for making print-based material. Okay. So, um, yeah, I actually do have my syllabus also in the form of a PDF that I created in Word. Mm -hmm. And I also take all of my essential policies and, and put it in an orientation module for my students. So they're going to get to it somehow. I know that may, may seem very redundant, but if information is that important, I want to be sure that everybody gets to it one way or another. Um, so yes, you are correct in, in, in your, your logic there. Great. Thank you for your help. You're very welcome. And how about um, Miroslava Alvarado? Hi, Michelle. I have a few questions, very quickly questions. So probably for Fabiola and you, I don't know who can answer my question. Uh, uh, let's see for the, the most uh, quickly. You are going to be available the, the course resources design in order to uh, download in the sandbox in, in, in our uh, Canvas? So the resources are not available now for download because they yeah. haven't been shared to the Canvas Commons. They're public. So it's a link that you can have access to. And then after we get it in, into the Canvas Commons, then it will be available for download. So I think what I'll do is when we do that, I'll put a note on the homepage that says, download this in Canvas Commons so that you know it's there, okay? The second question is, uh, when we're recording in the syllabus, oh, you froze, for me anyway. Huh? You, you hear me? You, you just froze on my end. Bobby, did you freeze on your end too? Okay, can you say that second question again? Okay, the second question is, uh, we recording in liquid syllabus, uh, we can go, we can record it directly, or we have to do like uh, we do, uh, we did this morning, go to the phone or the Zoom, and we pass uh, to the YouTube, uh, what we do uh, for the liquid syllabus. Right, so the liquid syllabus, think about it like a container for your content. So you've got your liquid syllabus in Google Sites, and then you'd have to have your video over in YouTube. So the video would be in YouTube, which is, ah. which is why I had you focus on that yesterday for those of us who are, who are, who are, who are here. Um, so once you've got your video in YouTube, when you get to your Google site, it's a just a simple matter of saying insert video, you plug in your link and it pops in there. Okay, sounds okay. good. Okay, but yeah, so yeah. You, can, you cannot record directly in the Google site. Thank you for your questions. For the clips, I have, uh, because I want to do like a clips thing, but uh, I, I have Android. I don't know if I, I have wrote something or how, how can I do? I don't know. If Bobby, you, you want to answer that I know you have. I am so sorry, but Clips is only for iOS devices. So um, <laughs> iPads, iPhones, um, I'm really sorry. I, I hope Android <laughs> comes up with something. I keep hearing Snapchat or Bitmoji. Um, I don't use those. So uh, I apologize, but it is restricted only to For iOS. the iPhone. Okay. And the last, very quickly, is uh, when I record in this semester, last semester for summer, I record in Zoom. 
And uh, some like uh, little videos for my students, like uh, samples, models, and lecture too. But when I recorded with the, my videos, I, I did 42. <laughs> and uh, uh, also have uh, like uh, a date and hour in, in, in my recording. Do you know how to take uh, this one out? No, I do not. And I don't know if you can, to be honest, but that would be a question to ask to Tech Connect, which is the part of assuming that you're with a California Community College. Yeah. Tech Connect, they are the ones that support Zoom in our system. Um, but I don't think you can take that out. Yeah, probably it's in the scene. I don't know if I have to, to can touch out. Zoom. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't I don't think you can take that out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate what this uh, it was wonderful. Uh, this uh, you might think challenge. Thank you very much. Uh. Thank you for your comments and questions. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I'm going to ask Yolanda Barnes to unmute. Yolanda, what is your question today? There. Um, I actually meant to put my hand down, so I think you answered it. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not going to, I can't see the, the humanizing, what you shared in Canvas. I can't see it in my Canvas yet, correct? So it's just a link right now. It's, you won't find it in your Canvas. It's, think about it just like a website. Okay. Okay. And then I'm glad you called me because I just want to thank you. This was, this has really been beautiful three, four, five hours um, and well worth um, my time. So all of you that presented, it's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Appreciate that tremendously. Um, and how about Anya Zinoviva? Um, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I also want to second uh, Yolanda that it was uh, super informative and thank you so much. I've been thinking about um, liquid syllabus for, for a while now. And uh, uh, the previous session that I attended from my local college um, presented a similar concept, but through Google um, Google Slides. And so I wanted to ask your opinion: what what what's advantage or disadvantage of Google Sites over Google Slides? So the advantage or disadvantage over Google Sites, if you were to do a comparison between sites and slides. So sites is I'm sorry, Google Slides produces a slide deck. So it's going to be very linear in terms of click, 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 right? You have to, it's kind of like the navigating through Canvas, right? right? The benefit of sites is that it puts the user more in control of the navigation. They can look at the different page titles and say, oh, that's where I want to go and loop in, right? So there's, you're, it's less about, there's less control of how the user interacts with the site. Um, and I do not think that sites would render, or sorry, I keep confusing my words. Slides will render differently on a phone. They'll be okay, um, but sites would be more responsive. So oh, okay. try it out. Oh, if you already have slides, I, I mean, you, you again. I don't, I'm just at the crossroad, <laughs> which way to go. Yeah, so I mean, sites is just, it, again, it puts the user more in control of where they want to go with, with the, the content. So if you were coming to my page and you saw grading, you could be like, oh, I, I need to go there right now, right? But if you were in slides, what if grading is like slide 10 and by slide five, you're like, I'm done with this. You might not get to the stuff that you want to see. So there are ways around that in slides, like you could put links on the first slide to the different sections, but it, it gets more complicated to navigate around through the content. If you're, if no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm completely aware of the technical side. I was, my question was more like about uh, the, I guess, like teaching aspect of that, like, you know, speaking of the student demographics, some of them 
a lot of my students would be like first year, first gen, and they're not technically savvy. So I'm thinking in terms of like, what would be the best tool for a given user demographic? Yeah, and that, that's why I like sites so much because it's, it's a website, mm -hmm. right? So most people know how to, who get to college, know how to navigate websites. And so that, that's, that's my recommendation. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Oh, right. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Lisa Pitts. Hello. Hi. Um, I had a question. I'm an adjunct faculty at four different colleges. <laughs> and would it be kosher to have a Google site liquid syllabus for all of my courses? as long as I don't put like, you know, like course specific information, you know, like contact information and all my rules are the same and stuff like that. Why not? <laughs> for, just once, like... for once in the life of a part timer who teaches at multiple <laughs> institutions, let's make something easy for you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I was just thinking, do I really want to make yet another set of syllabuses? Yeah. Cause you know, I'm already making nine. So, oh, you know. <laughs> oh, I feel, I feel you. That, that's just incredible. Thank you for your question, Thanks. Lisa. And you, you know what, I gotta be honest with you, Lisa. I went to high school with someone named Lisa Pitts and I've seen your name and I, I've always, I was like, is that the person I went to high school with? So I'm going to assume that we did not go to high school together. Where did you grow up? San Jose. Oh no. Okay. That's funny. <laughs> no. Well, now my mystery has been solved. I just want I've, I've heard that a lot. I was the yearbook editor at my high school. There were, you know, 618 people in my graduating class. So it would have been possible, but I'm from SoCal. Okay. Well, thanks for answering that question. Uh -huh. uh, and Stephanie Meredith. Hello. Uh, thanks for hanging around taking questions. Uh, mine is brief. Uh, do you know when the next humanizing at one canvas courses will be scheduled and available for registration because they fill up really fast and I haven't been able to catch one. Hey, Stacy, are you still with us? I'm here. You want to take that one? <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> um, we hope to have the schedule posted. Don't quote me, but we're going to hope by uh, end of next week, early following week. So we're close. We're, we, we have plans to offer fall uh, courses, so not to worry. They are coming. We're just, there's a lot of logistics that we still have to work out. And Perfect. you're right, Steph you. Stephanie, they do fill quickly, and we, yeah. wish, we wish we had the capacity to, to offer more. We have not ever gotten close to our saturation point. Um, so, yeah. So look for them hopefully by the end of next week, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, what's your question? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, my first question was about the um, pictures that you can search. When I went to put my site together, Google kind of gives you a search, like an area where you can get pictures and so-and-so. Is that okay? Because I totally use that. I just figured it was copyrighted and it was okay. But now I'm like, I don't know how Google determines what images have been shared with the Creative Commons license. I don't know how that works. So I'm not the person to answer. I've always been, um, I've always been skeptical. Like, how do they know that these images, I know what you're talking about. So I personally, I like to go to a source where I know they've been shared with the, with the, the proper copyright license and I know how to attribute them. So that's what I do typically didn't use any outside pictures because I was thinking, I want to be safe. I'll just use what they provide. And now I'm like, mm, bad idea. So maybe I'll go through and, and take some. I don't have a lot of them, but I did use a few. Uh, my other question was, um, um, I, I use my um, liquid syllabus specifically for pre-course content. And it, actually, summer was my first time doing it. So my, I'm like very new. So just so everyone knows. But um, um, I only place the link for it, say, on my profile in Canvas. Um, and I, it's almost like I wasn't really using it after the pre-course content. So what, 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 how should I be 
be thinking about this, should I? So in Canvas, go to your page called Syllabus and include it there because students are going to go to that page when they're looking for the syllabus. Okay. It's a link, so you can put it in multiple places. I put it on my home page in the first week and it says, if you didn't get a chance to look, I call mine a welcome package. If you didn't get a chance to see our welcome package, click here. So it's there when they come into the course. I also put a link on the syllabus page and that's where I put the, um, or click here to download a printable version. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. I just, because the, you know, and, and while it is this, this pre-course contact, these are resources that students do use throughout the term especially when you find yourself referring to the syllabus. So um, yeah, put definitely put it somewhere where they will click and look for it. You can keep it on your profile page, but put it somewhere else too. Yeah. I agree. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for your question. And how about Carmen? You still with us, Carmen? Oh, there we go. Can Hi. You yeah. Hi, um, I have a question about the liquid syllabus and about making the Google, the Google uh, site web page. We use Canvas and I've in the past have used Canvas to post content, videos, all kinds of, you know, uh, assessments. But from what I'm seeing is I could put more of the content on the Google site and save my stuff on Canvas um, and put assessments, you know, just use it for assessing mm. other things? So I would, let me take a few steps back from that. Um, I'm not saying that we, when, when your students start, week one begins, I'm not suggesting that we use Google Sites for the learning content. I think that that should stay in Canvas. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about Google, Google Sites as a place to put your syllabus so that it's available during the course, also before the course, it's something students could even add to their home screen on their phone, so it's really easy to get to and open. Yeah, but I'm not suggesting that the course content should be separated from assessments. I think that you wanna keep that, you wanna keep kind of that continuity for your students inside of Canvas. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there might be another use for Google Sites that you come up with. I have, um, I have a project that my students work on and the, the project, I mean, I have a, almost everything in Canvas, but I have them go out to a Google site where I actually um, have, have like a, a grid of, of images for them to look at. Because for me, that's hard to make in Canvas. So there could be other uses that like specific uses that it makes sense to include um, throughout your course. But yeah, your instructional content should be in your modules in Canvas, yeah. Well, the reason why I'm asking is because I teach ESL and it's, it's non-credit. And so I have a lot of, um, you know, beginners who are just starting and not very computer savvy. Yeah. And need a lot of visual support for scaffolding. Yeah. And so that's where I was thinking putting more content on, on the uh, Google site because it probably lends itself, like you said, more easily than Canvas would. Yeah, I, I feel you. I teach um, art history, so the visual nature of my discipline is really important too, and that's why I lean on third-party tools like VoiceThread to make it very image-centric. Um, so yeah, that's 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 hard. That's a struggle. Um, I guess one of the things that I would that I try to think about is for consistency, since we have students who are now going to be accessing multiple courses online, the more consistency for like just a starting point, like, oh, I use Canvas for this course. I've got like, then we're kind of reducing their, that cognitive load. So I think that's, that's probably something you're going to have to wrestle with. But those are my, those are my thoughts, <laughs> Carmen. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Um, and how about um, Ed Bernard? There we go. Can you see me? Yes. Hi, Ed. Hi, Michelle, my old teacher, my former oh. teacher, not old. <laughs> and love everything you and Stacy do. Nice um, to see you. Yeah, I, I have a comment for both Carmen, who I'm also a ESL teacher, and also the, the uh, I'm, I forget the name of the woman who asked about Google Slides. So I, I think um, trying to keep our, uh, our materials 
bite-sized for especially for ESL and and the our students overwhelmed by content I, I found that I, I like to use Google Docs because it's just one page I use it not as you said not to put too much learning material but more informal visuals and um, personal um, content that's friendly and they and sort of uh, um, su su um, what's the word um, supplemental material if they're if they want to do extra work and I put links in Google Docs um, I have used Google Slides and it sends to their phone via remind you're familiar with remind mm -hmm. texting app right yeah but when you use Google Docs, you, you save it to, um, you could save as a, uh, you could publish it to the web, it's called. There's an option, publish to the web. And then it comes out as a link and the link could go to Zoom chat, the link could go to Remind. And then they just click on it on their phone and there they go. They just have a, a page of content instead of a whole website. So I, I understand what, you, what you're saying. It's good to have multiple places to go, but focusing on getting it to their phone is a good idea. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Karina Diaz. Hi, um, I, I apologize for, for the name. My girlfriend, we had oh. some confusion with, <laughs> with uh, the accounts. Um, anyway, no um, I have a question for you regarding um, uh, student feedback uh, on the liquid syllabus. Have you used, uh, have you used uh, the liquid syllabus in your classes or anyone here? And what, what are the students saying about it? Do they like it? Do you think that it's, I don't know, difficult to navigate? I don't know, I wanna get some of your feedback. So the feedback I've received is that it's beautiful and thank you for putting so much time into it. That's the feedback I've received. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else has, and I, I love your question. And I am going to be more intentional to start collecting student feedback. I actually think that this would be an amazing practice to do some, some research, use some data. Fabi, do you have any yeah. feedback? I know you've used a liquid syllabus. So I embed my liquid syllabus in my campus directory. So what happens is when a student Googles my name, my, my professional identity comes up as instructor of ethnic studies at Glendale Community College. And it has my email number, and then it has my web page or my liquid syllabus. I have a landing page because I have three syllabi connected to it. So then a student clicks on it. So it ends up becoming a great marketing tool to say, hey, come on into my class. Mm. Great idea. It's great Thank for part-timers. It's great to build that professional uh, digital footprint as well. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so look, let me just show you something real quick. I just did a Google search for Fabi and this is what I found. Is this the link right here? Yep. Yes, it is. And there, there you go. we go. <laughs> so you'll find this example in our course. I put Fabi's example under a heading that's, that's titled multi-course sites because she has this landing page that links out to different site, to different course. So Fabi's navigation, navigation is more complex. It is a kind of, I think a, a, a next level, but it's a, beautiful example of how you can have a simple link with multiple pages. So, and Fabi's, this is a page, and then she's got sub pages underneath every page that is specific to that individual course. So that's a great example, Fabi. I wish I had thought to ask you sooner, darn it, because <laughs> that would have been beautiful to show how you use it in that way. Thank you for your question. And uh, let's see, we're gonna go to Rachel Mercy Simpson. Hi, thank you so much. I've loved this course and I I'm so grateful. Um, thank you. I have, um, I, the only thing I have a 
I'm pretty private around most social media and I have like in general I establish really long-term um, and fruitful, wonderful relationships. Students contact me years later, but um, I have had a few students who've stalked me or who have, um, you know, with mental illness. Um, and, um, and I'm just wondering, I'm feeling, um, I keep a limited social media presence and I'm just wondering about having like the video online and also just um, if there are any um, downsides or concerns that things I might want to consider um, around safety and security um, that just any you know if there's any downside to it like I love the ideas and so much of what you're teaching so well first of all I'm I'm so sorry that you have experienced that and of course that folds right into your experiences and the choices that, I mean, you should be making choices that you feel safe about. So that's the first thing I would say, but um, I think I'm going to pull Fabi in here because Fabi had some great tips yesterday that had to do with, with this topic. Yes, Rachel, I, I, I've had that experience back in 2008. So um, something I've become very aware of is my, my own um, impression management. How do I, how much do I put out there and how little and what do I have in my background that could expose information about me? Um, if there's an address, if even my license plate, um, I'm very aware of my frame of what's in it. And um, you could also, for example, um, I have my email a uh, person for IT changed my email to ethnic studies at glendale.edu um, for the public Favi, but the private Favi is my institutional F Taurus at glendale.edu. So it, I think it's how you protect yourself is really be aware of how much you want to expose. So impression management is very important in that privacy realm. Great, thank you. Yeah. Will, will the questions and things from now also be recorded and the answers or no? They are, we are still recording, yes. <laughs> okay, awesome, yes. Thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you, really. thank you for your question. Thank you for being here with us, thank you. Um, and Ed, Ed Dole, I know that name from, from earlier days, but you, you still have your hand up, Ed. Yes, thank you, thank you, and thank you for uh, spending so much time with us uh, after after the the course. I, I I just so much appreciate your time and your effort. Um, I had two questions. One it derives from um, yesterday. Uh, someone, if I remember correctly, um, discussed the use of Google Voice, having a, a Google phone number. Is that something that you would recommend or consider? Uh, generating and putting in your syllabus as one of the uh, contact means? And if so, what, what's the, I, I can feel what the upside is, but the downside, you know, what is your experience with that? And then I have a second question. So Google Voice, for those of you who don't know, it basically, it, it gives you a phone number that you can give to your students. And when they call, it will actually route the call to another number without the students knowing what that other number is that it's routing it to. Okay, so in other words, my phone could ring, but my students haven't dialed my cell phone number. And um, Rachel's question just a moment ago, that was in my mind when, your aunt, when Fabi was talking, was my, um, my additional advice would be, don't put your, don't put your phone number, your, your personal phone number out there. Um, so I, I have recommended Google Voice. I have used Google Voice. More and more, I don't put phone numbers on my information. I ask students to come to me and if phone works better, then I set up a phone conversation with them. Um, I used Google Voice and I, I had something weird happen and I can't even remember the details, but somehow it got, it got hacked and it was like, 
it was some weird experience. And I was so concerned that whoever got into my Google voice was going to get my phone number. And so that's why I stopped using it. Wow. But I know a lot of people who have used it with, with a lot of success. I think uh, just to reflect on what you're saying is that it may not be a good thing to include that phone number in your syllabus, but should a student be having difficulty with an assignment that it would be better to speak uh, together, that I could provide that number at, the, at that point and then we could chat it up that way. Yeah, I think, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that you are interested in having students have a, a quick way to act to get to you. I am super responsive to messaging. You know, I've got, I've got notifications on my phone. I check my email all the time. So I feel confident that I can be very responsive to messages from students. Mm -hmm. But I'm not very responsive to phone calls because I get so much spam on my phone. Uh -huh. So I am so unlikely to, and then if someone leaves me a voicemail, I might not even realize it until two days later. So for mm -hmm. me, I don't, I don't really even want to, give my students that pathway because I don't think it would be the fastest way to get to me. Gotcha. So, okay. I'm, yeah. I'm really glad I brought that up. It will give me more, more things to think about. And, and the other, um, the other question that I had has to do with um, the, uh, I noticed that in one of the chats, uh, some folks were bringing up uh, the issue of that uh, the syllabus is kind of a quasi or maybe even exactly a legal document and that there are things like course description and objectives and all the rest of that kind of stuff, all that boilerplate that has to be included as part of it. My strategy with dealing with that sort of ugliness is to do the, the friendly stuff first um, and, and go through the, the easy stuff and then give a little alert. Uh, now, now here's, 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 the, uh, here, here's the boilerplate, here's the, the, the legal requirements of the syllabus. If they want to go on to that, that, that's perfectly fine, but I give them a heads up so they don't uh, get all clogged up in, into that kind of stuff and have a negative experience with that. And I was wondering what your reaction to that is. I, I don't need an attaboy with that. I'm just needing some thoughts uh, with it. Yeah, no, I think I navigate that very similarly. And that's another reason why I love using sites because I can put like the really engaging, welcoming stuff at the front and center. I can yeah. choose what students see first and then I can put that other stuff on it in there, but on a separate page that yeah. they can navigate over to. So um, Fabi, do you have anything you want to add to about that? Sorry, I was emailing, I mean, I'm texting other private uh, questions. I'm so sorry. Oh, no problem. No worries. I'm glad you're doing that. Um, yeah, so that's my response to you, Ed. I think that, that okay. that's a great strategy. Yeah, yeah, and I probably. saw that May, Meg asked a question in the chat about embedding um, Google Sites in Canvas. And it's, I, I just wanted to thank both you and Fabi for a marvelous presentation. It mm -hmm. really has changed my outlook. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for sticking thank with you. us, Ed. Thank you. Um, there is no way that I'm aware of to embed a Google Site. So that's the and, answer uh, to that they question. Walk, they block an iframe code, like they won't let you use an iframe code. I've never tried it. I've never tried it. Well, I have. Some, something that I wonder, I, I, to me, in my head, I feel like that would be confusing with Canvas navigation buttons and then Google site navigation buttons. I would rather just have it open yeah, in the tab. Not, yeah, I mean, yeah, I totally get that. That's why um, the Google sites, I mean, sorry, Google slides, um, some people are renting that as an option. That embeds really neatly inside of a Google page. So I've been toying around with that too, but um, I'll probably just do the workaround of um, having the Google site and then um, the Google Docs page, which also embeds nicely on the Canvas page as like the, the kind of in-house alternative inside my course. So the syllabus kind of looks one way there, but then I could use the liquid one for the, you know, the, intro email and stuff like that. So they get a, a flash of me. Yeah. Uh, meet on the course. I was just curious if anybody had solved that problem of embedding a site. And I, I just want to add in here to everyone. I should have said this earlier, but um, mm -hmm. I can't believe there's still 93 people here. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, ask your students at the end of that first module or, you know, at the beginning of the second module, ask them, include a survey or some open-ended question. 
about like, what did you think about this or a specific thing? Because that's the only way we're going to know what's working um, and what, it, what could be improved. So that's definitely something we should keep at heart. Um, thank you. Thank you, Meg. It's good to see you. Okay. I think we're going to wrap up. All the hands are down. Thank you so much. Big hugs to everybody. Um, good luck with your liquid syllabus. If you choose to take that invitation to create one, we look forward to seeing examples on that Padlet. And um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.